show. Call in now, 855-4-SHIFT. That's 855-472-4433. The Peter Schiff Show. You're back with Jeffrey Tucker. I'm the head of the laissez-faire club at LFB.org. I'm substituting for Peter today, um, who I'm, I'm pleased to say is a, a, good, a good friend of mine. Uh, we've we've had, had a good time hanging out here and there. I consider him something of an intellectual mentor. Um, I uh, write a daily newsletter called Laissez-Faire Today. You can subscribe for free by, at uh, lfb.org. Uh, it's in the sidebar right there. In the last segment, we had Addison Wigan. I'm not sure if you caught the URL of his new book. It's called The Little Book of the Declining Dollar. And you can get that book uh, for free by going to lfb.org, free dollar book. And as you can see, he's very articulate and learned on this whole subject of the catastrophe facing the American middle class thanks to the rise of debt and the Federal Reserve and the growth of government. On this segment, extraordinary thing, I've got another one of my intellectual mentors on, Stefan Kinsella. He's he's an IP attorney, intellectual property attorney, and I tell you, this man has single-handedly shifted the way freedom lovers, liberty lovers, think about the issue of intellectual uh, property. He is the founder and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom um, and uh, the founder and executive editor of Libertarian pa- Papers. And a man I used to think had a lot of crazy ideas that I didn't believe. It took me six years to finally come around and finally realize that Stefan Kinsella is right. Maybe we all need little bracelets to say something like that. Stefan Kinsella is right. Stefan, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Thanks, Jeff. I'm so glad to be here. Hey, listen, you know, I've written a a ton about the issue of copyright. I consider it to be a form of censorship, a a kind of monopoly privilege that uh, the government has conferred upon some people at the expense of other people, and it seems to me the world would run just fine without it. And We can talk about copyright, but, you know, uh, your area of expertise is, uh, in addition to copyright, is patents. And I've always had some sense that in my own writing I've neglected this topic partially because, uh, you know, I'm just not as comfortable with it as I am on the subject of copyright. Maybe you can just introduce this topic of, of, of patents. You are of the opinion that they are uh, on net harmful to uh, economic development and are a particularly pressing problem now in the digital world. Yes, and they're also a, um, a threat to um, human liberty as well. Um, as a practicing patent attorney, um, who doesn't really enjoy it that much anymore. I, I, I used to think patents were worse than copyrights. Um, I have come to the conclusion that copyrights are actually a, a much worse threat to liberty than patents, but patents are still pretty pretty darn bad. Um, uh, I mean, the basic problem with patents is that they're just a monopoly grant by the government, which is meant to slow down competition and to protect people from competition. Um, it originated in the Statute of Monopolies in England in 1623, uh, in, at least in a modern form. Uh, and back then, they were truth, you know, they were honest about labeling what they were doing. They called it a Statute of Monopolies. And nowadays, you'll have defenders of the patent system deny that it's a monopoly grant, although everyone recognizes that it it really is. Yes, and you know it's it's a kind of a problem because they're always pushed as an example of the enforcement of, a, of property rights. I've read countless uh, books. In fact, most historians, when they talk about the history of economic development, will credit the patent for and patent enforcement for spurring economic growth. Because unless you can have ownership over your innovations, then people don't have any incentive to uh, uh, to create new things. Uh, you would say this is just a, a fallacy of cause and effect. Well, it's completely ridiculous, number one. Yeah, in terms of cause and effect, um, there is really no empirical evidence that patents uh, do generate some kind of net wealth in society. In fact, all the studies that have come out that um, that are not ambiguous indicate that patents are a net drag on innovation because they prevent people from innovating in certain areas or they make you get permission or there's a lot of uh, – cost to hire the patent attorneys and to pay for the lawsuits and the insurance. and um, So you basically have a more oligopolized industry because only a certain number of players can afford to develop these big patent arsenals. 
Yeah, what like uh, like Apple and uh, uh, right. other social. Yeah. Can you yeah. give an example, uh, maybe you know one that struck you recently of how uh, patents are inhibiting uh, economic development, particularly in new technologies? Well, the smartphone wars is is just a raging battle right now. So you have three or four large players like Motorola, uh, Google with their Android operating system, um, Apple and Microsoft, and maybe Samsung, one of the manufacturers, just filing multi-million dollar lawsuits one after the other against each other and the end result will either be that one of them actually gets an injunction from a court and gets to shut down their competitor's product like a, maybe a, an iPad competitor or an iPhone competitor uh, or something like that or they'll just make a, a royalty uh, sort of they'll do a cross license and they'll pay each other lots of money and they'll go back to business but the little guys on the outside can't hope to compete with this so you have this small walled garden of a small number of players who benefit from the patent laws. Um, there have been some recent studies which are striking, uh, just like trying to estimate the cost of what's called patent trolls. Yeah. Or what is a patent troll? What, 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 sure. what is a patent troll? Can you tell me so, what a patent troll is? Uh, technically, a patent troll is what we call a non-practicing entity. That means someone who makes a, makes a who has a patent, but they don't make the product that the patent covers, or they don't make any products really. So when they sue you for patent infringement, you can't countersue them with your own patents for their competing products. So basically, you have a little you have little defense against a patent troll. Um, and there's an estimate recently that patent trolls cost the economy like hundreds of uh, like almost half a trillion dollars over the last uh, half a decade. Uh, if you sum up all these studies, um, the best estimate I've been able to come up with is that. The patent system clearly imposes at least $100 billion a year of just complete deadweight cost on the economy every year, just in the U.S. alone, just from the patent system, not even from the copyright system. And that doesn't include all the costs that are, that are unseen, obviously, which are just, uh, obvious, you know, just incredibly in incalculable, uh, it's right? It's probably an, an, an underestimate by an order of magnitude or two. Well, I find it—I find it, in fact, heartbreaking because you th you think about all the 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 brilliant young computer programmers that are out there uh, today, uh, trying to uh, get a foothold in the industry and do something new and something exciting. Uh, they face a terrible thicket, right? Yeah. I mean, just—I yeah. mean, uh, they think they're writing fresh code. As soon as the thing takes off, next thing you know, they're slammed with all kind of uh, uh, lawsuits, and it's not until they become successful. Yes. Yeah. What they're doing that they're that they're they're hit, and it's my understanding too that the backlog on approving patents is uh, you know as long as uh, two two years, and this is despite the patent office having something like nine 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 thousand <laughs> employees. Oh yeah, far more than that actually, and uh, they're allegedly profitable like the post office. Um, yeah. uh, actually, I think the backlog is a good thing. Uh, the longer it takes for these yeah. monopoly grants to come out is good. But um, there's, but, I mean, you know, Bill Gates was famous for saying uh, back at the dawn of the. Uh, of Microsoft when it arose, back when software was not clearly recognized as being patentable, which it is now, he has said that you know uh, if, if software had been patentable at the inception of Microsoft, uh, it may it may have never arisen. Uh, it may have killed the whole software industry. Yeah. But of course now he's in favor of it. Um, yeah. Well, this is often what happens, right? I mean, the the company develops a war chest, and yeah. then uh, and then actually becomes a, like a conference of the cause. Steve Jobs is a good example, right? He was in. Uh, famously proclaimed that everything he ever did for Apple was was basically stolen from other people, and and he bragged about this because a good entrepreneur yeah, knows how to learn from the successes of other people. But then they then they get they get religion and uh, decide the patents are a great thing. Now, are you saying that every company that owns any kind of patent is a sort of a bad guy? No, of course not. In fact, that companies uh, are compelled to acquire patents now because if you don't, you're defenseless against uh, your competitors. But you have an incentive built into the system for everyone to waste tons of money on patent attorneys and filing fees and lawsuits uh, just so that they can counter sue each other or threaten each other. It's like an arms race. It's almost like a mad during the Cold War. Basically, yeah. you acquire all these nuclear weapons called patents just so that you don't use them. Um, you know, but but unlike the, uh, the the Cold War, 
you know, we don't need to have this. If we just would get rid of the patent law, no one would have to have these patents in the first place, and we would have tons of more resources available for research and development. So, it sounds like we need a big Reykjavik moment, you know, like with uh, Reagan sitting down with Gorbachev and deciding to eliminate uh, nuclear arms. It didn't really work, but it was a nice try. Yes. Uh, maybe we need that uh, in, the, in the patent world, too. Right, where, where all the big companies come together and say, "Look, this is just stupid. Let's let's get let's let's uh, all go, go to the government and say, uh, look, we'd be better off in an atmosphere of yeah. freedom rather than uh, th this kind of, uh, uh, as you described, you know, IP cold war going on." Arms well, race. At, le at least in the in the in the Cold War, most normal humans realize that there's a threat from nuclear weapons. Mm. There's something bad out there. The problem with patents is it's a very arcane, complicated field, and everyone's bamboozled into thinking that these government-granted monopolies, which are anti-competitive and meant to slow down competition and to protect people from competition, they've been told that they're property rights. And so they're confused about it. They let the experts handle it. Um, I mean, look, software patents are relatively new, about, tw say, 20 yeah. years old. And there's been a recent study that indicates that if the software industry in the U.S. alone was to hire enough patent attorneys to study the patents that are coming out in software to make sure they're not infringing, it would literally require 6 million full-time patent attorneys a year and about $2.7 trillion to pay them to just do this, just to avoid infringing patents. And just by comparison, the software industry only generates about eight or $400 billion a year of profit. Sure. And... Um, there's only about 40,000 patent attorneys in the U.S. right now. So basically we have to mobilize you know, one-tenth of the workforce to become patent attorneys and waste you know, uh, one, about one-seventh of GDP just to make sure that companies don't emulate and compete with each other. Stefan, when we get back, I'd like to talk to you about the relationship between uh, intellectual property and actual property, which I understand you actually do believe in. So you're not uh, speaking as some sort of socialist. You're, you're talking about talking as a real free market intellectual. We'll be uh, returning here just in a moment. The Peter Schiff Show. Peter Schiff School of Advanced Economics. Twice the education of a Harvard MBA. For one one hundred sixty-eight thousandth the cost. This is Jeff Tucker. That's sitting with Peter Schiff. You can join twenty-five thousand others and subscribe to my daily newsletter, Laissez Faire Today. Uh, at lfb.org, it's absolutely free, and, uh, and I send out something provocative and uh, often outrageous every day. At least it'll make you think a little bit. And talk about provocative and outrageous, I think that last segment we had with Stefan Kinsella probably alarmed a lot of listeners who imagined that patents are very much like normal property rights, it's just something to be uh, protected. And any, any kind of system that protects property is going to be issuing all kind of patents. But, you know, Stefan, I think you made a point that undermines this, and it was that uh, you said that in the early days of software, there were no patents at all, and we saw gigantic amounts of creativity and, and growth. I mean, it implies, I think it, it proves that that what you call intellectual property is really not something built into the structure of the universe. It is something created by politicians. Well, absolutely. I mean, really, until about 200 years ago, there was no institutionalized protection of intellectual property. You did have, in the, in, in the height of mercantilism in, in, the, in Europe and in England, you had the, the crown granting all these monopolies basically as favors to their cronies. Um, so one, you know, someone would get the monopoly on playing cards. Uh, they didn't invent playing cards. They just basically bribed the court, or gave, you know, uh, they helped. The, uh, there was uh, monopolies on uh, uh, fur and sheep's, and and these guys would help the crown collect taxes. And then they would call the, the crown and the government and say, listen, I think my competitor across the street is selling some playing cards without uh, the official seal. They're competing <laughs> with me. So they would send the uh, the police in there and arrest these guys or rough the place up. So we have basically a crude version of what we have now with the government arre arresting Kim.com in New Zealand and uh, 
confiscating CDs and DVDs and imposing yeah. taxes on blank tapes and blank media and things like that now. It's, yeah. it's, really it's become a real different. threat, hasn't it, to freedom? I mean, free, especially in the digital age. I mean, you've got American foreign policy all kind of uh, geared up to enforce intellectual property all around the world. Yeah, I mean, even John Locke and the, the, the American founders like Thomas Jefferson, even though they were mildly in favor of some kind of incentivizing system of patents, they didn't. They never thought it was a property right or a natural right. They just thought, you know, maybe we can have the government grant these temporary monopolies to incentivize invention or disclosure of invention. Oh, you make a very good point here. I mean, you know, our listeners are probably right now thinking, well, wait a minute, patents are kind of written into the Constitution. But the Constitution, uh, the way it's phrased, represented a kind of liberalization of the patent, or at least so they believed, taking it away from something that would be owned by the government and give it, granting it to the patent holder or the copyright holder uh, himself. And that, that seemed to be a kind of individuation of, of intellectual property, didn't it, to that generation? Absolutely. I mean, I think that um, in, in the terms of in the field of patent, well, it was in the field of copyright, copyright was used to censor free speech and to, and to free, the freedom of the press and to control what was published. And so, one of the reasons that the Statute of Anne in 1709 in England, which sort of institutionalized copyright, one reason it was favored by authors was because until then they had to get permission of the crown or the guilds or the church. Uh, so, copyright allowed them to make the decision. That their work could be published instead of being censored, and in the field of patents, um, the the statute of monopolies of 1623 basically removed the power of the crown to grant arbitrary monopoly grants, but it retained one part that had been going on, which was the grant of monopolies to inventors. Yes. Um, so that's why it existed, because they didn't abolish all of it in 1623. Yeah, and then this is the problem, right? You make one little mistake, get, give government even the, the most minute power, and, and enough time goes by, and, and next thing you know, that one power is wrecking the entire system. And that seems to be what's going on uh, right now. Uh, now, let me ask you something very specific that people have often asked me. Let's say that I invent a piece of software, and I put it, on for, put it out for sale, and I come up with a way to exclude exclude people from uh, reverse engineering that software and marketing uh, so-called pirated copies. I, I, am I violating anybody's rights in doing that? Absolutely not. There's nothing wrong with not revealing secrets or things you know unless you want to or people are willing to pay you for it. Uh, in fact, at the inception of the, of the software sort of revolution, you, you would have people compile a program. They would design it in some, some kind of language, basic or C or Fortran or whatever. And then they would compile it into an executable file, and they would sell that. And you, it was almost impossible to reverse engineer that. You could just play it, but you didn't know um, how to do it yourself. So, so you, I mean, sure. it, it's a, you, you, and you don't want to call that uh, intellectual property. You want to call that just a management strategy of some sort, right? Absolutely. It's just basically keeping some information to yourself and not revealing everything. Just like everyone has a personal life in their in their personal life, you don't reveal all your personal details. In your business life, you don't have to reveal all oh. the details either to everyone. So it's like your privacy settings on Facebook. <laughs> exactly. In other, in other words, invention should just follow the normal rules of the market, which is that you can do anything you want to maximize your profitability, provided you're not seeking some kind of special favor from the state that's going to coerce a third party. So, so it really comes right down to it. It's not that complicated, is it? Well, yeah. The basic insight is that there is nothing special about being an innovator. That's just another type of entrepreneur or creator on the market, and everyone in the market faces competition, and they have to come up with ways to respond to that competition. Either they offer a better service, or they bundle it with something else, or they continually innovate. Uh, but there's always competition that will arise in response to the price signals that you send out, the profit signals. When people see that you're making a profit, that's a sign to everyone in the market, hey, I'm doing something that's valuable for humanity. Why don't you come do this too? That's but right. when they do that, they reduce your profit margin, and you have to yeah. adjust. And in this you way, you're always yeah. benefited by it. 
Well, Stephanie, you're the author of a book called Against Intellectual Property. Uh, the Leslie Fair Club is publishing a special edition of your book with a new introduction and some reflections by me. The Leslie Fair Club, as you know, works as a, a, it's like there's a cover charge, and then once you get in the door, all the drinks are for free. And I can tell you that your book is a pretty stiff drink, uh, you know, for anybody who believes in pet copyrights. So uh, I, I thank you for being on the show and for making such a difference. You know, it's a pretty rare thing in, in this world when somebody comes along with a brand new idea that has such a powerful effect as, as your idea has had. you changed my mind, certainly, and I know you've changed the minds of many young libertarians uh, about this crucially important topic. And I thank you for being on our show today, uh, Stefan. We look forward to releasing your book very soon and to all your great work in the future. Thanks, Jeff. That was Stefan Kinsella, a real intellectual in innovator. I've enjoyed hosting the show today. Um, of course, I'm just thrilled to have had these three mega high-powered intellectuals uh, here to help me and help help me see the world more clearly and help you see the world more clearly. Good colleagues. Good.